Hello, good afternoon, and a warm welcome to European Policy Center online policy dialogue on climate insecurity and geopolitics in the Arctic. My name is Jonela Cholan, and I'm a research fellow at the EPC in the Europe in the World program. Today, I have the pleasure to moderate this discussion. Uh, today we'll be speaking about the Arctic, once a hotspot between the US and the Soviet Union, the region, the Arctic region was an example of peaceful multilateral cooperation in the past three decades under the UN uh, Arctic Council framework. Nevertheless, uh, the climate change is transforming the Arctic into a geopolitical battleground. As the effects of uh, climate change are developing four folds faster than anywhere on the globe, the combination of economic opportunities, legal challenges, institutional capacities, and military capabilities create a multitude of security challenges that will require a multidimensional political and military solutions. During our event, we'll address the current security issues in the region, the UN Arctic security uh, strategy towards the, the, I'm sorry, the EU Arctic strategy, NATO's approach to the region, uh, as well as Russia and China's plans and involvement in the Arctic region, but also the perspective from the Nordic countries. Uh, for this event, we have a stellar a panel of speakers line up for you, uh, and uh, I would like to briefly present them. We have together with us today uh, Elena Wilson Rowe, which is a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and adjunct professor at the Center for High North Governments at North University. Mary Sol Maddox. Uh, she is a senior Arctic analyst at the Poral uh, Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Michael Mann, uh, he is the EU Special Envoy for Arctic Matters at the European External Action Service. And Mikhail Rule, uh, he is the head of Climate and en Energy Security Section uh, at the Emerging Security Challenges division at NATO. I am very grateful to our speaker for making the time to contribute to our discussion. Thank you. And now uh, to all of us, some logistical information. After we'll have the opening comments uh, from our distinguished uh, speakers, we'll start our uh, question and sessions, question and answer session. So please write your questions in the Q&A box, or if you want to address it themselves, uh, please click on the raise hand button. Uh, please be concise as much as possible in your questions. And I would like to start our discussion with um, Michael, Mr. Mann. Um, let me start by asking you to give us a brief context on the current climate security issues in the Arctic region and briefly present to our audience uh, the EU Arctic st uh, strategy, which was adopted last October. Great. Well, thanks very much, Janela, first of all, for inviting me to be here today. And it's great to be on such a distinguished panel. It's uh, a bit nerve wracking to be the first one to kick it off, but uh, I'll do my very best. Um, yes. So. Uh, obviously, we have had uh, an Arctic policy uh, for since 2008, and this is the fourth uh, sort of iteration of our Arctic policy. But it's much more, although the, the sort of main issues and the main priorities have stayed pretty constant, um, the, the situation, as you explained in your introduction, has really sharpened with um, uh, climate change far, far more serious uh, in the Arctic than it is generally around the world. And of course, that has massive implications for every country. And that's why it's so good uh, that uh, it's not just Arctic states who are taking an interest in this issue now, it's the whole world, basically. Um, so we uh, developed our Arctic policy based upon existing priorities, but uh, things are, are much more uh, earnest now. So if you look very briefly at what we aim to do, uh, the first number one priority is um, 
dealing with the effects of climate change, trying to slow down, mitigate climate change and adapt to it. And also general environmental degradation, which is linked to that as well, of course, and biodiversity protection. Uh, we also try and remember that the Arctic is actually a living region. It's not, uh, often you see uh, images of the Arctic, you would think it was a, a wasteland full of polar bears, but there's 5 million people who live in various Arctic regions. So, you know, we have to bear in mind that people have a have livelihoods and, and you know, uh, they, they live there and it needs to be a living, breathing place. And so we try and put an emphasis also on sustainable economic development. That's a sort of one of these buzzwords, unfortunately, that we always use, but it means basically creating future orientated jobs and, and trying to help um, the people, who, people who've lived there for such a long time to maintain their lifestyles and their livelihoods as well, the indigenous peoples and the non-indigenous peoples. Uh, international cooperation for us is an extremely important thing. I mean, the EU is kind of like the, the champion of multilateralism, I suppose. And um, given that, um, you know, we, we accept that the Arctic states themselves have the primary responsibility for what happens on their territory, and there are eight Arctic states, so it's not, it's not the Antarctic. There are actually, you know, eight sovereign states who run the affairs of the Arctic, if you like. But there are so many things that must be done uh, and can only be done or could best be done through international cooperation and by regional cooperation as well. You mentioned already the Arctic Council, but there's other fora as well. And then, of course, uh, the way the Arctic is run is according to international UN law, the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, for example, being key to this. Um, everything we do <clears throat> in the Arctic is based on science and research. Of course, that also has a huge, you know, uh, you know climate change aspect as well. Much of our Arctic research is climate change based. And also, of course, bearing in mind, as I've mentioned before, the views and the and the needs of the people who live there, they live there. They see the challenges that are happening and the changes that are happening. So we should be definitely listening to them and, and, and taking account of their, their views and their knowledge. Um, thinking more specifically on the, the topic of this uh, webinar today, obviously um, climate change uh, is the big security challenge, uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, that we face. Obviously, there are, um, you, know, in, you know, there are local incidents and there are growing crises in various parts of the world that come and go. And uh, we have a particularly difficult situation at the moment, of course. But behind all this, climate change is a clear and present danger that's been there for a long time and is getting much, much worse very, very quickly. And for us... Um, you know, I'm going to be the slightly boring one, I think, at this seminar, because, you know, there's a lot of speculation about uh, the possibility for sort of conflict, military style conflict in, in Arctic regions. And it is true that there's been a big build up of uh, military capabilities, uh, particularly in the Russian Arctic. However, we see security, Arctic security in much broader terms uh, than just hard security. Um, obviously, environmental security, we've seen the first effects of a thawing permafrost with collapsing oil tanks and big um, oil slicks and pollution. We see that there's a great danger that uh, thawing permafrost and melting ice can uh, give the possibilities of uh, future pandemics as various uh, bacteria are released from, from thawing ice. Uh, we see that it completely undermines ways of life as well. I mean, if you look at um, if you look at Russia, uh, something like 60% of Russia is constructed on permafrost. And if, as this starts to uh, thaw and, and collapse, that has enormous ramifications for Russia. And when it comes to the fight against climate change, they are still very bullish about the future for hydrocarbon development in, in the Arctic. But there will come a time when they have to take the, the threats caused by the burning of hydrocarbons extremely seriously, because it's going to affect them possibly more than anybody else. So we, we see a very broad um, definition of security. It can also reach into search and rescue. Uh, I mean, search and rescue, it's such a vast area uh, and there are cruise liners out there and there are LNG tankers out there, but there are also uh, nuclear submarines out there. So there are, there are big uh, potential ramifications for not having proper coverage uh, for search and rescue. And we do what we can with Coast Guard cooperation and using our use of our satellite monitoring systems. So there's there's a huge definition for us of, of security and safety. We, we tend to broaden it into more general uh, understanding of safety. Now, there has been, as I said, a big buildup of uh, military capabilities. 
Uh, but what we would like to underline is that Arctic cooperation still works. Clearly, um, there has been a reduction in our cooperation with Russia, for example, but we still do uh, work with Russia on certain projects, as long as it's in line with our foreign policy, um, you know, our overall foreign policy towards Russia, our five principles, and as long as it brings benefits to us as well as them, you know, so we work on environmental issues, uh, for example. And we see that although there is a lot of military activity, generally the you know, the cooperation, international cooperation in the Arctic is still pretty good because all the Arctic states have an interest in making sure that it does remain good uh, and they share common challenges of which climate change is the biggest one. Also, Russia has massively built up its, uh, its Arctic strength, new um, facilities, new weapon systems, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the second fleet, of course, uh, the, 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 the northern fleet rather. Um, but there are, we don't see from the EU perspective, and perhaps Michael may see this in a, in a slightly different way, but uh, you know, we don't see that the, there's a danger of conflict any day soon in the Arctic based on Arctic issues. But it's more a reflection of uh, global uh, strategic positioning by various countries. We've seen Chinese activity in the Arctic. That's part of global uh, uh, concerns and, and, and positioning rather than Arctic specific things, I would say. Also bear in mind that Russia's Arctic coastline has become much more exposed simply because the ice is melting, so they're feeling more vulnerable. Also, they have a lot of dual use infrastructure in the Russian Arctic too. So while I don't want to be complacent and play down the obvious um, you know, escalation of military activity, I think it's important to underline that by and large, uh, Arctic cooperation remains rather positive than negative. And perhaps I'll stop there because I always talk too much otherwise. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insight and thank you for starting um, uh, with uh, this idea that the Arctic cooperation is more uh, positive than negative because nowadays everyone is speaking about and we are reading about the Western and Russian relations. But I will, I will ask you further on. Um, on this more. Uh, let's move uh, now to Marisol. Um, Marisol, I would like you to give us an overview of the geopolitical um, struggles in the Arctic, uh, maybe from the US perspective, or, or you can also give us um, the transatlantic perspective. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to be here and among such a wonderful panel of speakers. Um, so yes, as Ambassador Mann just discussed, uh, climate change is the number one driver of the changes in the Arctic that is really bringing it back to this place of geopolitical and geostrategic prominence. Um, it is experiencing climate change at around three times faster than the global rate. And the changes in the Arctic have not only regional consequences, but global ones as well. And it's not just those first order impacts of a changing climate that are of consequence, but also the ways that state and non-state actors respond to those changes. So the push for global decarbonization, for instance, is one of those really profound shifts that's now necessarily underway um, in the near term because of the, just how profound this shift is, that the price volatility will be more challenging to manage and big producers like Russia will benefit in the short term, though, big caveat, their geopolitical influence is not going to be able to persist if they do not diversify and adapt their economies to the new reality. So in the meantime, uh, you know, this is definitely a very important area for uh, transatlantic and international cooperation on, on innovation and technology, um, you know, re in reducing costs. Um, so I do want to note on, on the U.S. side, the way that the, the U.S. approach towards the Arctic has changed under the Biden administration, or I, I would say has been significantly strengthened, not only um, in terms of you know, a, a renewed embrace for multilateralism, but also in terms of certain 
structural developments that are really important for building enduring US presence and interest in the Arctic. And that's really important for conveying that US interest in the Arctic is not something that will be dependent upon the administration. Um, so an example of that is the new DOD Regional Center, that is uh, the Ted Stevens Center, which will be opening um, in Alaska um, that, that was authorized and, and funded uh, fairly recently. And you know, we have uh, Major General Randy Key is in charge of, of bringing that into being. And he is somebody who's extremely well known in the Arctic community, incredibly collaborative. So it's also somebody who um, it really conveys confidence in kind of you know, who is, set, is in charge of something like this. And that'll be a really important place for um, like a hub for international cooperation on, on Arctic matters. So the Biden administration is also working on a new executive level Arctic strategy for the United States. We've received, uh, you know, previously some some criticism for having an outdated one. Uh, President Obama had had one, a White House level strategy. Um, President Trump had then clearly deviated from those that set of objectives, but did not produce their own strategy. And so one is currently underway. Um, and I'm, I'm not totally sure when that will be out, but that will really help to just show that kind of high level coordination of the different aspects of, uh, you know, of US interests um, in the Arctic region. And like Ambassador Mann was saying, it the, the security piece of it, while that is really important, is only a small piece. And that's certainly not the predominant um, kind of feeling of, of, you know, the Arctic is, is more about cooperation and really the Arctic Council as this preeminent intergovernmental forum for cooperation on, on matters that uh, are of mutual interest. And so they, they have persisted and, and really need to continue to persist. Um, President Biden has also restood up the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, so that will help to coordinate all federal agencies with Arctic equities. Um, and, and that's no small task, but my colleague, uh, our former colleague, Ambassador David Bolton, is in charge of that. And again, this is somebody who is just, uh, you know, if you have to think about Mr. U.S. Arctic, I would say that is uh, Ambassador Bolton and just uh, is so well respected and just so beyond competent. So again, in terms of kind of conveying that the Biden administration is really choosing people who are the absolute best for these positions to really like get US strategy towards the region right. And, and to really you know, do this in a way that's all about capacity building and, and building these partnerships. And then there were some provisions in the latest Defense Authorization Act that are working to um, have greater bureaucratic and, and practical strengthening of the seams between the three different combatant commands that have equities in the, in the Arctic. Um, and, and then as well to better equip our service members and to help strengthen high latitude communications uh, with things like low earth orbit satellites. And so, you know, Russia really is the elephant in the room here, um, especially with the, the current circumstances. So I'll just kind of br briefly dig into that. I do want to note that when I talk about Russia in the Arctic, I talk about China in the Arctic, they're two very different you know, actors because Russia is the, you know, the largest Arctic state, uh, a legitimate Arctic state. And China, even though, you know, their 2018 white paper that made everybody get up in a tizzy, you know, they call themselves a near Arctic state. It's not a thing. They are, uh, you know, an economic actor, but they're, they're not yet like a military threat, threat in the region. But I mean, they, it is a concern, um, but they're not yet a, a, a military actor in the region. So um, some of the concerns with Russia, especially if they do decide to further invade Ukraine, are that there would be economic, military, and diplomatic concerns for the Arctic region. And, and what's most important here is like, you know, our ability to continue to jointly collaborate on escalating challenges around 
climate change, accelerating climate change, biodiversity loss, um, and also all of the, the areas of mutual interest. So I do think it's really important to state that it's really not in Russia's interest for kinetic warfare to break out in the Arctic because it's an extremely important part of their economy, their, their current economy, but also their, their plans future economy. Um, you know, Putin has decreed he wants 80 million tons of cargo to be going through the Northern Sea Route by 2024. They're around 32 million tons now. Um, you know, they're definitely ramping up the shipping ambitions in a way that's really not commensurate with their ability to respond to a search and rescue incident or respond to a marine, uh, like an oil spill or some type of environmental incident. So th these are places where some of the work that we've done, both um, through bilateral cooperation between uh, the U.S. and Russia across the Bering Strait, but also through the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, are really important for reducing risk in the region. Uh, that's reducing risk to uh, for marine for maritime activity, but also the the strength of the blue bioeconomy is absolutely crucial to Arctic economies, and so we really need to be. Um, you know, very careful about the potential for contamination of fisheries. Um, for instance, you know, Russia is supposed to be um, basically uh, recovering these sunken uh, Soviet subs that have spent nuclear material in the reactors that are at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. I've seen that the EU uh, very generously has offered to help to fund some of this, but this is like a highly, highly technical process. They're supposed to have their first meeting in, in June of this year. Um, and that's the kind of cooperation where, you know, if they do further invade, it's going to be really hard to especially because they are also chair of the Arctic Council. So a lot of the meetings are going to be in Russia. It makes it even harder for us to continue that cooperation because the, the political will to go to Russia at a time when they are potentially, you know, launching the largest ground invasion in Europe since World War II is the political will is not there to be like, oh, yeah, let's go here and be, you know, hunky dory with them. So it, that, that's where, you know, Russia really is their own worst enemy in terms of the success of their Arctic Council chairmanship. Um, but also, you know, we need to be thinking about this isn't business as usual. We have an accelerating climate crisis on our hands. We need to be able to think about the great power dimensions of, you know, what Russia is doing, what China is doing. Obviously, a, a strengthening China really is not conducive to global human rights and transparency and a lot of the values that are so important for flourishing economies and societies. But we have to also be thinking about climate. And, and that's where I think the discussion component is really important. And so I hope we'll be able to, to dig into that a bit more. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marisol. That was really interesting. And now I, I would like to go forward to Elana uh, because she's from a Nordic country. So she uh, feels more daily the, the issues uh, and uh, she listens to all the discussion about uh, how the Nordic countries are affected by the climate insecurity, but also by uh, geopolitical threats uh, within the Arctic uh, region. But uh, Elana, I would like you to give us to our audience an overview of the interplay between climate change governance diplomacy among the main uh, actors, because I know that you are, have researched previously and uh, written a lot on this uh, subject. Thank you, <clears throat> Ionella, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this really timely panel to be thinking about where we are, what needs to happen next, how we got here. So thinking about kind of how security dynamics and diplomacy interact in the Arctic, I guess I have three key points to make. Um, the first one relates to kind of a bird's eye view of how do we think about how politics has played out in the Arctic since the end of the Cold War. And I think 
too often we kind of fall prey to these sort of easy black and white that there are periods of good cooperation and good relations and there are periods of more strained relations. Whereas really, if we look back over time in how Arctic cooperation has progressed, what we see is kind of a complex, pragmatically driven environment in which Arctic states do cooperate against in areas of mutual interest and sometimes frequently against unresolved tensions, certainly an unresolved security tension that's characterized the region and the relationship between states. Um, so this kind of co cooperation and conflict is really what we've seen. It's never been entirely one rosy, easy scenario or a completely um, impossible militarized or securitized scenario. Now, and these efforts serve, I think, have succeeded so well because they serve to mitigate shared risks. And as Marisol was saying, that a lot of these risks are accelerating or amplifying or we're seeing new risks due to the, the rapid climate change in the region. It's also picking up on Michael Mann's point, it's important to keep in mind that the Arctic is home to indigenous peoples whose sovereignty cross national borders in the region and that these border crossing sovereignties have been a really important driver for treating the region as something else than an only kind of national or interstate um, area of politics. So it's worth remembering always that when we kind of talk about these geostrategic questions that it is, as Michael Mann was saying, the living Arctic. It's not a blank stage against which great powers are positioning their chess pieces at will. It's a, a peopled environment, and it includes everything from remote villages to thriving small cities. And I think just to keep in mind that under the Arctic Council and in other forums, you've also had a real growth of also professional networks in science and in research that are important both in providing the, the knowledge base for Arctic policymaking and also contributing to the sense of an interlinked Arctic. And this is a place in which European milieus have been very important as well. So I guess that takes me to, to the second point that it's kind of worth remembering in, in today's you know, extremely strained and worrying environment in Europe and beyond that these cooperative frameworks are not necessarily only anchored in, in positive views of the other, because I think we're running out of, as Marisol was saying, that this question of what, will there be political goodwill? Should the situation worsen between, or should Russia invade Ukraine? Should there be war, for example? Or other forms of tipping points of difficulties, say a miscalculation or accident that could quickly escalate in an environment of low trust and, and low communication. But it's also against that, it's worth keeping in mind that of course the preceding decades have given a structure to, to Arctic politics. It's not simply, um, you know, it's not as if the Arctic states wake, wake up each day and think of which, how should we, what would we like the governance of the region to be like? There are very some long-standing structures. And so this, this includes kind of international law, and Michael Mann mentioned the law of the sea. Um, to me as an analyst, something that's been really fascinating is that there was this sort of shock Arctic um, the first kind of 2007 was this shock year where all, there was a real wake up around the retreat of Arctic sea ice as measured in the month of September. And kind of from a classical geopolitics perspective, you might think, oh, then that'll open up kind of a race resources um, or some sort of competitive development of the region. But what we actually saw happening after that was kind of um, a race towards cooperative government with the, the Arctic states concluding a string of kind of important functional policy area specific binding agreements from search and rescue to, for example, oil spill um, preparedness in response to um, the, uh, a moratorium or a precautionary approach to the potential for fisheries in the central Arctic Ocean. And some of Marisol's colleagues were involved, former colleagues from the Wilson Center were involved in that. But it was also, interestingly enough, a place in which Russia and the US frequently cooperated on these binding agreements. You frequently saw US Russia cooperative chairing on these key issues. So that's an interesting kind of tradition or moment we can come back to. I think it's also worth, of course, mentioning that the Arctic is already addressed in important multilateral bodies. The International Maritime Organization found common ground to negotiate the Polar Code, which gives us kind of a set of standards for shipping operations in the polar regions. I think we're likely to see, and I hope we'll see, a lot more attention in UN climate negotiations on Arctic specific issues. It's a great opportunity for the kind of growing interest in the region from, from, from outside to really seek to work to mitigate climate change 
the rate of it in the Arctic, including through specific issues like black carbon, for example. Um, and of course, we have the Arctic specific multilateral bodies and several of the panelists have already mentioned the Arctic Council, which as many of our participants know is one of the eight Arctic countries along with the indigenous peoples of the region as permanent participants, a suite of important observers who provide research and policy insight and linkages to, to global issues. Now the Arctic Council doesn't address these kinds of hard security issues, but otherwise has a fairly wide agenda from sustainable economic development to emergency response. And these are really important areas of cooperation because they're not really addressed elsewhere. There isn't another cooperative Arctic state or location where these issues could be addressed as effectively as they are today. Um, with the annexation of Crimea, we saw kind of the suspension, some of the security meeting places in the region that I think maybe we'll hear more about from, from the next speaker. But for example, the Arctic Chief of Defense meeting format was suspended. But interestingly, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum kind of grew up in the immediate years after and has become an important venue for coordinating on more soft, soft security issues. So finally, I mean, it's of course, there's no, as all the previous speakers have said, there's no you can't the, the constraints and drivers and stressors in the region can't be underplayed or shouldn't be underplayed. And these kind of relate to, of course, the rapid, rapid climate change in the region, which brings really new policy challenges at many levels on both land and sea, different across the Arctic, different according to permafrost extent, and so on. But as we also, as I mentioned earlier, the de the decline in sea ice also opened up a uh, a triggered kind of a Arctic state leadership on a lot of important issues. The realization that, that a precautionary approach to the region in the sense of governance more generally was necessary and required. Um, the tensions between NATO and Russia do play in. Maybe I could kind of come, I think these are mitigated by the structures of governance. They're mitigated by the shared interests that drive this Arctic cooperation, but at the same time, there's you can't um, overlook the impact that it's had on policy. And I can now provide a Norway-based example. So for example, in Norway's 2011 um, kind of high north strategy document, there was an aspiration. This is in 2011, so a long time ago in geopolitical senses, I guess, that, that Norway would seek to achieve with Russia an equally kind of interdependent and transparent relationship as it had with its Nordic neighbors. And for those of you who know the Nordics or know Europe, like these are very closely integrated countries in, in many, many ways. Now, I mean, fast forward now, you know, 10, 11 years later, like that, that kind of statement is, is unthinkable. And uh, while Russia continues to feature strongly in, in Norway's high North policy, it's to a much smaller degree, other cooperation with you know, the EU, other global actors, other Arctic states features much more strongly. But Norway really does emphasize continuing to, to work closely with Russia in areas of mutual interest and does have a longstanding and rather successful cooperation, for example, around Barents Sea fisheries. However, you know, even today, there was a, a recent you know, announcement of that the sorts of the co coercive diplomacy that we've seen today is really going to, or from Russia, towards Ukraine and towards European and Western states is certainly going to figure in, of course, to the, the policy approaches of Arctic states, not in the sense of suspending, but I think, and as I'll get to in the end, I share Marisol's concern about that um, a lack of political will, a lack of that these this type of cooperation will be increasingly, new novel forms of cooperation may be a very hard sell, for example. And I'll come back to that. And then finally, and I know we're going to come back to the question of China and the Arctic and other questions in a bit, but it's just that you know the Arctic is more affected by dynamics between Arctic and non-Arctic states. It's the Arctic in the last decade has generated considerable increased interest. And I think that's generally a good thing. These are big challenges. It's important to have all hands on deck, knowledge, interest, funding, not least of important research and, and measures. Um, to solve Arctic problems relating to economic use, shipping or fishing, which are likely to be extra regional actors or addressing the problem of climate change. But then there is, let's maybe we can come back to that, the question of 
you know, that China is increasingly interested. There is a lot of hype, but there is a lot of um, understanding, you know, China is a major actor in, our, in global politics. And there has been some concern that you know, China-Russia convergence or dependencies could create new dynamics in Arctic politics. I think those are somewhat exaggerated, but it does point to the increasing intersection as the Arctic becomes more important economically, more open, more active, that there are going to be more kind of these policy areas where they're not separate. It's not an economic sphere and a security sphere in the Arctic. And just to take another example coming out quite recently from, from Norway is there's in the, the papers the other day, there was a, um, a large report from very concerned kind of unions of fishers, because as with Russian increasing um, military exercising in the Barents Sea, it triggers a very a good system of transparency and alert that is meant to like, clear the area for weapons testing. But at the same time, it can happen right in the middle of, you know, an import an important fisheries season. And these aren't small fishing boats that can zoom in and out of port. The changing of position represents great economic losses. So that was um, just an example of some of the the fact that these as the Arctic becomes more economically important to a larger number of actors. I mean, the Barents Sea has been important economically for a long time, but I think we're gonna see more of these kind of overlapping, um, competing to some extent policy fields. So just to, to wrap up, I guess, you know, what, what preoccupies me is that, you know, we have these enduring tensions between Russia and Western countries, at the same time there has alongside these tensions, albeit at a much lesser degree. We've had the growth of cooperative frameworks. We've had the growth of structures and internationally international law that helps constrain and shape what happens in the Arctic. But I think, you know, particularly thinking about the, the rate of climate change that, that Marisol was um, introducing, it's the question, you know, is this to scale? Is maintenance of the status quo enough to temper with both intensified geopolitical winds and maybe new new regional challenges from new economic sectors, competing interests, potential spatial conflicts in the ocean, new challenges in technology and data to soft security. So I think that's why conversations like this are important because the expert and policy community needs in some ways to continue to think about what are, what are good possibilities for today's situation with today's set of political will, but we also need to be thinking ahead about either both, hopefully not, but a worsened situation or an improved situation, what would be good security and, and governance solutions for the Arctic. So I'm glad to see that in the wider Arctic policy community, there still is a lot of thinking about confidence building measures, how to reduce risk in the Arctic. Not all of them are politically feasible at the moment, but I think it's an important conversation to be having. I look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, you, you mentioned something uh, important and I would like to bring to all these uh, ideas and perspectives that we gather so far, the NATO perspective. And for, for this, I would invite to Michael uh, to uh, tell us more about how NATO sees the ongoing and the current uh, climate uh, insecurities in the Arctic and the possible geopolitical tensions. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm only giving you my personal views because, uh, first of all, that's what we always have to say. And second, when I was trying to find out what NATO's role in the Arctic is, uh, it's very difficult to find it uh, because there are very few statements by NATO. And that in itself is already a message. Um, and um, when Michael said earlier that uh, as a hard security um, uh, outfit, we may have a different look at the Arctic than the EU, actually not really. Um, the problems are pretty much the same, uh, even if our remit is much more narrow. But I think the philosophy that lies behind our approach, our very careful approach, I should say, is very similar to the philosophy we already heard from the other three speakers. Um, it, uh, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there is still, the Arctic is changing. I think we all agree about that. Not only climate change, but also political tensions are, are uh, more visible than they were, let's say 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, overspill from Europe, uh, Ukraine crisis was already mentioned. Uh, sanctions on Russia, uh, for example, include um, uh, technologies that they need for extraction of uh, resources in the high north. So there's everything is somehow connected. Um, but um, I think NATO still has 
and maybe for good reason, some sort of an ambivalent uh, approach to the region. Um, this is nothing quite new. I remember in 2009, there was a major um, uh, conference in Reykjavik. Uh, it was, I think, hosted by our highest military, Sakur. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a lot of speculation in the press and also in think tanks that this would now herald the beginning of a major new uh, Arctic policy of NATO. Um, I was a speechwriter of the Secretary General at the time, and we wrote his speech for that for that occasion. But when we then thought, let's also turn the speech into an op-ed, and we could say, we, you know, we could do this in a Reykjavik newspaper, we finally decided against doing it because we couldn't come up with a message that would satisfy all the stakeholders. If we would be too timid, then people would say NATO is 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 a non-entity. If we are too strong then we would probably scare away other stakeholders in the region. So I think till, till this very day, we are sort of caught in this ambivalence that we are, of course have an obligation uh, to defend our member states in the region. And as you already said, Yonella, there are a lot of uh, countries that are NATO members or like Sweden or Finland, very close partners of NATO. So there's a, there's a, a, a military requirement to, to be there. But at the same time, there is still a, a little bit of Arctic exceptionalism uh, in terms of the regimes that have been built over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, and uh, we don't want to upset those mechanisms um, as long as they still work. Um, I would say, uh, let me just make three, three quick points. Um, yes, there is more military competition. Um, we have uh, increased our uh, military posture as well as Russia in particular has increased its own. Um, We've had major exercises, for example, the 2018 Trident Juncture, which was one of the biggest exercises uh, in, in recent years. Um, and we've also established a new command from the North Atlantic that also covers the Arctic. After all, the Arctic is part of Article 6 of the Washington Treaty. It's part of the Washington Treaty area, the NATO Treaty area. Um, but there is still no appetite uh, in, uh, among allies to move away from the general you know, careful approach. Uh, the Arctic allies are seen to be in the driver's seat and they should be in the driver's seat. And in fact, when you ask Arctic allies, so what would you like NATO to do more? They usually say situational awareness, which is always right. I mean, there's always, we never have enough situational awareness. So you could see that even the Arctic uh, literal states uh, in NATO that are worried about uh, what Russia is doing, for example, um, are not um, overbearing in, in their idea of what NATO should do in, the, in this region. Um, on Russia, a couple of points, um, we come back to this later maybe. Uh, of course, Russia has major ambitions for the Arctic, uh, especially in, in raw materials uh, that they want to exploit. Uh, They're still very focused on traditional fossil fuel. Uh, and right now the prices are very high, so uh, uh, it, it, it looks pretty good for them uh, for the moment. Um, but you can also see that in, for example, the Arctic strategy of Russia 2020 compared to 2013, you see much more concern about military competition. Um, like generally, I think Russian policy, we see it in Ukraine, is obsessed almost with this idea there will be some sort of Darwinistic fight over resources, over, uh, over, over influence. Um, and, and I think that, that that's a bit of a, of a worrying uh, thing. Um, then again, as, as Michael already pointed out, their eastern uh, border is, is, is melting away. Um, it's a very, it must be a huge concern for Russia given the length of that border in the high north. Um, and of course, the high north is part of, uh, is the home of the Nordic fleet uh, of Russia, a northern fleet. And it's also, of course, a springboard for any kind of power projection vis a vis the Atlantic. So the Russians uh, are, of course, naturally concerned with this whole region. It mixes. Uh, uh, economic ambition and military ambition, both offensive and defensive. Uh, and uh, But as long as they are not, um, let me put it this way, Russian, the Russian military posture in the Arctic is still less uh, intimidating than it is in parts of Europe. And as long as that is the case, I think uh, NATO will react, but it will not try to, to, to overreact. Uh, China has declared itself in the Arctic state and uh, the Arctic is part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and China is generally dram dramatically expanding its naval forces. Um, but again, there is very little Chinese military activity in the Arctic. And therefore, as again, as long as that remains, um, NATO is not, I, I think, uh, going to aggravate uh, the story by, uh, by being too uh, alarmist. Uh, 
My third point is about uh, climate change. Uh, NATO has now um, adapted, adopted a, uh, a, a much stronger uh, uh, role or uh, has, has given climate change a much bigger role in its own uh, thinking and planning. Uh, we've uh, agreed a so-called climate change action plan at the last summit. Um, and the idea is to mainstream climate concerns into virtually everything we're doing in planning, you know, in, in, in procurement of military uh, items, in the way we exercise, in early warning and, and so forth. So, so climate is, is now moving center stage uh, in, in NATO. And of course, as has already been said, since the, the, the climate change in the Arctic happens much faster than elsewhere, it's the epicenter of climate change, if you will, um, one could think that maybe through this new climate change um, story, uh, NATO will play a bigger role in the Arctic. But here again, I would be very careful. Um, yes, of course, we're looking at the Arctic in terms of climate through the climate change lens. Uh, when we do build, for example, new early warning systems, weather forecast systems and so and the like, we have to look at the Arctic. Um, but uh, it, this does not necessarily translate into NATO becoming a major actor in the Arctic. I think that one has to make this differentiation. Um, we, we, uh, we, as I said, we need to be able to protect our Nordic members. Um, and this means that our posture, our military posture, our presence in the region will change if Russia's posture changes. It will change if the Northern Passage and, and the uh, Northwest Passage become ice-free and you have more traffic there. Uh, it was already mentioned by Michael, oil spill, search and rescue. These things will also be interesting, of course, from the NATO perspective. But um, it's nothing that we're kind of pushing. It's simply something that we will see, uh, observe, and then, and then react, hopefully, uh, a, a, in time to, to make a difference. Um, my last, uh, maybe a last point briefly, is that if... Um, there is a tendency among some think tanks to come up with all kinds of new schemes for, for um, uh, let's say, uh, consultate, consultative frameworks uh, on military issues and the like. Um, I, I'm not so sure that this was going to help very much. I think if we would play, play a more, let's say, assertive role in the Arctic, uh, I cannot think of any new mechanism that would reassure the Russians that what we do uh, is, is, is you know, not against their interest. So I think the, the idea is not so much in, in inventing new systems, new, new structures. The idea is really in, in having policies that are, let's say, that act with, with restraint and that um, maintain, or at least try to maintain as much uh, of the high north low tension um, slogan uh, that has, has served us so well. Um, I'm always following the advice of the Lord, I mean, not that Lord, Lord Robertson, my former boss, who once gave me the advice, if you're walking on eggshells, don't jump. And I think the same holds true if you're walking on thin ice. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your insights. Uh, very useful to for the following question that I will have to all of you. But uh, before starting my second round of question, I would like to remind our audience uh, to uh, write their question in um, the Q and A uh, section or raise the uh, raise hand button uh, if they would like to address it uh, personally. Uh, I saw that we already had one question, so I would like to address it to all of you. Um, Michael, I saw, I saw that you gave us here an, a written answer, but maybe uh, uh, the other colleagues would like to also address this one. Um, so we have a, a question from um, Fraser Cameron. Uh, he is a senior advisor at PC, and he asked, uh, uh, what's the prognosis for the opening and the commercial use uh, to, the art, uh, to the northern uh, route? Is this China's main interest as regards to the Arctic? And uh, apart from that, I also would like to ask you uh, about the which are the areas of cooperation and areas of divergence nowadays among the Arctic players? And I would like to uh, dwell a little bit more on those. Shall I, shall I kick off or? Uh, 
Um, on, in answer to Fraser's question, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Russia, as was mentioned earlier, has got some very ambitious targets. It's got a number of Arctic policy documents and has very ambitious targets to enormously increase the amount of freight going through the Northern Sea Route. Uh, it's very much in its interests. And it's also, uh, let's say, attempting to control that shipping, perhaps more than are allowed by the international rules on occasion. But um, uh, so, I mean, it makes entire sense to them to ship their LNG out through that route, for example. Uh, it is one of the main factors attracting the Chinese interests to the Arctic, definitely. They are heavily investing in Russian LNG as well, and they need the energy. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, in theory, at least a convenient route. Uh, however, I would say, um, as far as sort of European shipping companies confer, uh, concerned, they haven't really been very interested because they have a particular model of trading, which is, you know, they have to be at their destination port at a, at a particular time, and they want to stop off at ports en route, and that infrastructure doesn't exist along the northern route. And, and basically, although, you know, the general picture is that the ice is melting and it is more accessible, that doesn't mean it's accessible. I mean, you do, uh, this year, for example, the ice appeared earlier than usual. So it's, it's still very, very uncertain. You need icebreaker capacity. So it's a, it's a much less certain way of shipping your goods. So I think there is a difference between the uh, Russian Chinese approach and the, and the sort of European approach to, to the Northern Sea Route. Um, obviously it's getting, the ice generally is getting less, but we're hoping we can slow that process down as much as possible. In terms of areas of cooperation and areas of difference, uh, amongst the Arctic states, my answer would be that generally everybody really understands that they have um, mutual interest in making sure that things work. Uh, there is a bit of competition for continental shelf uh, to get delineation of some of the continental shelf uh, because that gives you obviously access to resources and so forth, but that's that's being handled by the, by the UN. Um, um, generally cooperation is pretty good um, uh, in most areas. Uh, obviously, for example, in the Arctic Council, if you were to read the, the Russian chairmanship program for the Arctic Council, it could have been written by the European Union in a way. It's all about sustainable economic development and looking after indigenous people, et cetera. But you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I think there are very different interpretations of what you mean by sustainable economic development, for example. So on paper, the cooperation is very good. In, in practice, it's very good, but there are different uh, interpretations of certain things. We have a very different view on sustainable economic development. Uh, we, for example, rather surprising some people, we propose that there should be an end to the exploration for oil, gas and coal in Arctic regions. And that clearly is not something that Russia could subscribe to, but it has gained support from our member states of whom three are Arctic states. So, you know, there, there are different, nuance, not, not even different nuances, there are different interpretations of, of major issues, but generally the understanding is that everyone realizes they have to cooperate in the Arctic for everyone's benefit. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you. That was a great answer to two very interesting questions. I think on the, the China point, I'll just supplement supplement briefly that also um, was also mentioned in the opening remarks that um, China also does have a very strong interest and concern for the, how global climate change is going to play out in terms of its own food and human security. And as we, you know, we've seen an increasing array of, of impacts, quite dramatic climate impacts in some Chinese cities of late. So also the Arctic is also, also seen in a, in a very kind of, in, through a scientific lens as a place that China would like to be involved in to, to learn about the dynamics of climate change and also to contribute to solving those broad problems. At the same time, you know, there are a, you know, an occasional um, issues, for example, relating to dual use or what exactly are kind of some of these um, activities, which interests are they serving, very, very possibly several at, at once. But at the same time, you know, China and the Arctic has really worked to profile itself as a responsible and engaged actor interested in solving regional, regional problems. And I think also 
there are driving economic interests. There is this long-term view and perspective on the, the opportunities that Arctic shipping could bring, even though in the shorter term it is kind of riven with challenges and difficulties and hasn't become the same route. Uh, it's not yet an easy route. It's not yet every year an equally trafficked route. And the Northern Sea Route remains primarily kind of point to point shipping, as others were saying, things coming out rather than necessarily transiting the region at any great um, degree. As for um, perspectives between Arctic states, I think and this will kind of get it down into quite quite nerdy level, kind of inside the Arctic Council, and relates to that last point that that Michael mentioned about well, what does sustainability mean? Because it's also I have noticed, you know, sometimes I look at Arctic strategy documents and I think, oh, if these were my students' papers, I would run it through the plagiarism software because there are very there is a very shared rhetoric and understanding of how we talk about the Arctic, especially when it comes maybe to sustainable economic development. But what that actually means in practice is quite different and that may relate to different views of what is sustainable what's essential you know for russia it's not uh, at present a future uh, an economy without oil and gas is uh, would be a catastrophe a political and economic catastrophe for them and also even as you look across the arctic the arctic it's very geographically varied and i know we've all heard this many times in the in the panel but it's worth considering again that also because of that geographical variation there's also very different economies that you know you know in the united states and alaska you do have kind of a natural resource driven economy like in russia norway the high north and arctic economy is is nationally important in a broader in 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 terms of contributions of gdp to the to the national budget from a variety of resources, fisheries also further south, some in oil and gas development. And so you, I think you definitely in the Arctic Council over time, you do see these tensions between where the line goes between the politics of, of conservation, what exactly sustainability means as those are you know, really often fall within what states are used to having as their, their national remit. But I also think particularly when it comes to shared challenges such as protecting biodiversity, which Marisol was mentioning earlier is a pressing challenge. And for that, really, conservation is an extremely important solution and tool to protect um, threatened species as their climate, as their natural habitats maybe kind of compress quite substantially. And also every time, of course, when we turn to questions of, of, of ocean development, that, you know, kind of what happens in on one national coast rarely stays there. And that can be everything from oil spill to I think there's a certain um, interest in in certain states about the prospects of deep seabed, of seabed mining and rare minerals and so on. And I think all of those questions, which actually kind of for at a certain extent from the coast really just fall into a national remit, I think they're going to be discussed and debated globally. So I think we'll see some, I think, again, in the next chapter, as um, we start working towards a, a more green economy, and also as countries like Russia, look to replace some of these Arctic resources and values with what is a very important internal domestic political promise about that the Arctic is the treasure chest, that is the source, it is a source of revenue, it is how Russia will continue to um, be maintain a certain level of of wealth and well-being, that there will be, I think, sort of some oil and gas, of course, will certainly remain a debate, but I think there will be new debates around new forms of, of ocean economies in the in the decades to come. Thank you very much, Marisol. Great. Um, oh my gosh, there's just so much, like so many great threads here to pull upon. Um, I will um, comment on the the question about um, China's interest in in the Arctic, and um, I would I would recommend a report that recently came out from CNA, uh, the Center for Naval Analysis in the the Arlington area um, in the United States. They just uh, released an updated report on foreign direct investment in the Arctic. And in 2017, they had issued this report looking at Chinese foreign direct investment. And some of the figures there, it was on um, actual investment, but also proposed investment. And for some of the smaller economies like um, you know, Greenland, which is seeking you know, to become fully sovereign from Denmark, um, you know, Iceland, there are certain uh, potential investments that would have a disproportionate impact on the economies, which could then be leveraged for political influence. And so that 
plus um, and particularly an incident in 2018 around uh, airport renovations in Greenland and who was going to finance those, the prospect for Chinese um, financing was very alarming to both uh, the Kingdom of Denmark and the United States. And so between, I'd say those two, like that, that report that definitely triggered a lot of conversation, um, that really, I think, that plus that incident um, really catalyzed the way that the region started thinking about, you know, kind of the downsides to foreign direct investment from China and how that could be leveraged um, for, for ways that are not really healthy for, you know, the Arctic states and the region. So there's been a lot of pushback towards um, investment in sensitive areas or in certain types of um, sensitive, you know, areas that have exposure to technology or industries that are um, important. So um, th the new report really reflects that shift, which I think is for the, the betterment of, of the Arctic. I wish it was a different circumstance because we really need to be cooperating. But um, unfortunately, the way that, you know, the qualities of kind of a rising China are just you know, not conducive to like, like the values that are really important. And um, also want to know in terms of the Northern Sea Route, a longer season, um, you know, for the Northern Sea Route um, it is, is not the same thing as the Northern Sea Route being safe. Um, and so yes, the longer term trend is that the transit season will lengthen. Um, but it's still a very high risk area. And so if anything, the perception that the Northern Sea Route is becoming more accessible um, is actually creating perhaps a false impression of the Arctic being safer than it is. And so we actually saw that in October of, of just this past fall, when over a dozen ships got stuck in, in the Northern Sea Route because there was a, you know, quote unquote, early season freeze up but you know it's the arctic like we should be expecting these kinds of conditions in october um and and it, it came out later like months after the fact that two oil barges had grounded and russia didn't notify anybody and and until well after the fact you know even in terms of coast guard just notification you know that that's where something where we need to have a lot more transparency and i think that the the lack of transparency from russia is one of the the biggest concerns whether it comes to an environmental incident or anything related to radioactive material as well because they have a, a you know egregious history there of um, not only a lack of transparency like with the the failed recovery of the skyfall missile in 2019 in the white sea they not only uh weren't transparent about what was happening but they turned off the the radiation monitors that feed into the international monitoring system so they were actually obscuring the transparency there um and so i think that in terms of you know that lack of transparency also ties in with some of those areas of you know convergence and divergence. So yes, like Ambassador Mann was saying, on paper there's a, a lot of agreement about you know sustainable development, but there are certain structural issues um, within Russia that that make it very challenging um, to having the transparency that we need. Um, not only in terms of, you know, if there's an incident being transparent about what's happening and the risk that's coming from that, but also in terms of actual sustainable development um, and, and financial, you know, the financial world and kind of, you know, beneficial ownership and, uh, you know, the endemic corruption in, in Russia is, is really makes it challenging for uh, you know, the business practices to, to develop for the region and, and to attract the type of um, basically like the cooperation that we need for economic development in the region. Um, and then also, you know, Russia really is seeking to, um, to develop the Arctic zone there. And so they have created uh, a free trade zone with like significant tax incentives for their entire Arctic zone. 
Um, and this is something, especially in terms of free trade zones and ports, this is something that's really important for the policy community to think of in terms of the, tr the potential for trade-based money laundering, and counterfeit production, and also links between construction and uh, organized crime, which there is a demonstrated link there. Um, and there's also, there's been really interesting research on the ways that strengthening transnational criminal activities and these these networks ac across the world that are really so opportunistic and much flatter than kind of traditional um, criminal organizations and so their ability to adapt to new circumstances and to exploit new opportunities is really important for the policy community to understand in terms of how good policy could be undermined by bad actors or how they could exploit new opportunities and i i think we it's important to not be naive to the fact that there are you know, many new opportunities emerging for these bad actors. And not only are they taking money out of the legitimate economy, uh, they also, they, they undermine democracy, right? They undermine, you know, through things like corruption, they really uh, undermine the legitimacy that governments need to have in order to be strong and to tackle climate change in an appropriate way. But there is also really interesting research on the direct link between strength and criminal organizations and the inability to reach the sustainable development goals because of these network systems that just are so corrosive on like every aspect of you know financial markets to you know human society. So that that's another issue that I I think does definitely um, should be dug into more um, within the scope of of sustainable development. And okay, last thing I'll say um, that, so I, I think there's some great opportunities here too. So as Ambassador Mann was saying about how the EU um, is really advocating for oil, gas, and coal to not be explored in the Arctic. I think that um, there's, a, it's really challenging, you know, for places like Alaska, for Norway, for Russia, even if, you know, you, you want to move away from these resources, what that looks like at a practical level is really challenging. And so I think that that's a place where, um, you know, we could have significant increased cooperation on spurring innovation of, you know, just imagine what do these new economies look like? And that's a great place to bring in indigenous communities that have, you know, the, the just transition framework and looking at financing certain things that can not only help to diversify Arctic economies, but also strengthen local resilience and that ability to adapt as climate change accelerates. So it's really multifunctional there. And I think that's a place that is not only practical, but also like a really positive way of thinking about, you know, not just the climate risks, but what are some of the opportunities? Thank you very much, Marisol. Uh, Mikhail, I have two questions for you for, because apparently our um, participants um, are interested in learning more about uh, NATO and what NATO is doing on this uh, region. So one of the questions it's um, uh, deals with uh, the goal of the cold response as, as currently conceived and if there is any climate change specific features or consideration to it. And the other one, it's um, a, a larger question, but I will try to uh, to brief it a little bit uh, about um, how Arctic will be included in the new strategic concept uh, that will be adopted this year, and how it this uh, the fact that Arctic will be included could be perceived as a turn to a more ambitious approach to the region, thus further drawing Russians' attention? Or would it uh, say that, um, on the contrary, um, the fact that Arctic will be specified there will allow for more transparency and confidence in building? Thank you. On the first question, cold response, that's a, an exercise that happens, I think, every two years or so in, in, in the north. And uh, this time, uh, it's going to be um, in March, April, I believe. It has about 35,000 troops involved. A lot of countries, I think about 20 countries are involved, or even more, also partner countries, Sweden, Finland. Uh, it's happening mainly in Norway. It's under Norwegian command. 
and it is a um, it's the biggest uh, of the of cold response that we've had so far and the basic uh, thrust of it is to to reinforce norway in a crisis basically to bring forces from all over nato uh, into the north uh, into norway um, and and help uh, an ally in in distress um, uh, this is uh, has, has happened uh, these exercises have happened regularly in the past but there was a time when uh, only a few allies took part in it. Now it's uh, the interest is obviously much greater, and I think we all know why. Um, uh, the uh, second question, and, and on, on the climate question, uh, is there a climate angle to it? I don't know for sure, but there is a general point uh, about sending your forces into the north in an exercise, because then these forces, and they don't all, all come from that region, uh, these forces then learn how to how to work in 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 such extreme climate, and this is part of the of the education and training. Uh, so for many allies uh, from from let's say Central Europe or so, this is quite an ordeal to be exposed to to temperatures like that. So there's always indirectly a climate element to it, but it's part of, of I think regular military education. Um, the question of the strategic concept is a very intriguing one. Um, are you making it better or are you making it worse if you if you put something into the strategic concept? In 2010, the last, last strategic concept had for the first time climate change mentioned, and it had a full, for the first time, a full paragraph on energy security, and yet Arctic or High North was not mentioned. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the same happens now. It will be, climate will be all over the place in a new strategic concept. So I have my work cut out for me, but... Um, uh, there will be the obligatory paragraph on energy security, I presume. But whether High North Arctic will be mentioned is still, in my view, a totally open question. Because I'm, I'm not sure how much the literal states, Canada, Norway, US, how much they want to really put their finger on this. There are other allies like, let's say, Romania, uh, who look at, at the Black Sea and want this to be mentioned. Uh, as a region of particular concern, NATO is, is, is reinforcing its posture in the Black Sea, for example, as a result of what's going on in Ukraine. But the High North, um, I think, is still probably a touchy issue. Um, uh, it, so it will be interesting how, how, they, how, how allies uh, sort this out. I personally would probably still belong to the old school and say don't, don't mention this particularly because you may have... Um, you may get some of our Nordic uh, allies into 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 trouble, but if these allies were to say we want it, then it will happen. Can I just? I promised to talk more about Norway than I actually did, so I thought I'd supplement with a tiny observation. Um, that one thing you often hear from I'm not a NATO security politics expert, but I just want to share a part part of policy is that you often hear that. Norway is interested in, in uh, of course, NATO is an extremely important factor in Norway's security policy, but you'll often hear that Norway also would like to contribute as kind of part of NATO's eyes and ears in the North and be in the conversation and be have this be a developing topic. And I think that that relates to what um, Mike, Mikael Rulo was saying about also this kind of walking on eggshells, which is a mix of both that you often also hear from NATO about both deterrence and assurance and how that plays out in a way in the, the Arctic that's about kind of accumulation of many, many, many small things. So in some of the small things, like for example, in historically and still today, Norway has had a commitment not to have um, foreign troops permanently stationed in peacetime or uh, another one um, relating to that even when these exercises do take place, in the kind of higher latitudes of Norway, they often avoid areas that are close to the Russian border, but they're kind of stationed. I don't, that may be evolving for this year. I'm not updated, of course, on all of the, the plans, but there are certain informal or formal informal practices that are engaged in how to kind of engage in this very delicate and important activity of, of assuring security in the North. Thank you. Marisol, would you like to bring your ideas on this? Yeah, I'll just yeah, briefly touch on, on the NATO piece. Um, and I mean, I think it is really important to take a very cautious approach towards the Arctic because of just how important the, the cooperation and goodwill is in the region and how well that has been working. That being said, 
Um, yeah, like, you know, five of the eight Arctic states are, are members of NATO. Um, as Michael said, uh, you know, we, NATO needs to be able to respond, um, you know, if there is some type of Article 5 incident. Um, so what I think it's so important to be exercising in a way that is really just about normalizing NATO's ability to operate anywhere, the Arctic, just like anywhere else where they have you know, members of NATO, um, and, but that you really need to exercise and have that experience in order to, to be able to, to safely operate and, and to really be able to thrive in those conditions. It, it is such a, uh, you know, the tyranny of distance, the, the austere conditions, the lack of infrastructure, the extreme weather conditions that you can encounter. This isn't a place, and as you likely know, you know, this isn't a place that you can just drop into and be like, oh, okay, I guess we're gonna like, we have to respond to this. So those, exercises are so important for, um, you know, building interoperability, building, uh, you know, build, building this kind of common operating picture, being able to make sure that we can safely operate, that we have the, and, and the U.S. has learned this, by the way, as we've been kind of reestablishing our operational capabilities in the Arctic, we've been, you know, having troops training with uh, with the, in, in Norway and with the the actually the Royal Marines, um, the Royal Navy from from the UK that has been um, exercising up in the Arctic as well. So really learning about like material science, what type of lubricants are you using in your weapons, and how you can you know operate vehicles. Like there's so many things that you take for granted in operations in the mid and lower latitudes that you just you don't even think to consider until you're up in the Arctic and you realize, oh, wow, like, why isn't this working? You know, so, so that's why I think it's just really important that, you know, you, you can take a, a measured approach to increasing NATO's operational capability in the Arctic that is not overly provocative to Russia. Of course, the current security, you know, situation around Ukraine has really reignited, you know, debate ab about NATO and, um, you know, I think it is really important to have, uh, you know, the ability to understand Russia's perspective on that and to just be reasonable in the approach. It's not about being provocative or aggressive towards Russia. It's just about, you know, having that ability to, to have a strong deterrence by demonstrating that if something happens, we can show up. So I think that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much, Marisol. Now I would like to move uh, from NATO, discussing about NATO, uh, to the European Union perspective. And I would like to ask uh, Michael how and if Arctic security is taken into account for the upcoming strategic compass of the Union that will be launched in uh, uh, March? Um, well, it's, I think, not, it won't be a it, a little bit like what Michio was saying, it, it won't be kind of uh, very prominent. I mean, obviously, the, the strategic companies is about developing a, a strategic concept for security and defense for the European Union. But, um, you know, A, we don't have sort of hard security competences in, in the same way that NATO does when developing such a document, for example. But also it's part of the, the whole idea of a, a little bit what some of the previous speakers have also said, if, if you bring it up, you're sort of suggesting that there's a problem. We are still very much of the view that we want and we believe that the Arctic can remain an area of cooperation and that any uh, security operations that are going on there are not caused by Arctic specific problems. So therefore, you know, we you know, the, the Arctic will not be a, a particularly prominent part in the strategic compass, I'm sure. It will be borne in mind as one of the many parts of the world where, you know, security issues exist, but it certainly won't be a, a priority area uh, for the reason that, as I just explained, we want it to remain a kind of exception, perhaps. Uh, and and I, I think I explained in my introductory comments that, you know, for us, Arctic security is a very broad kind of spectrum of things, everything from search and rescue to environmental uh, disaster. So, you know, we, we take 
a much broader view of security in the Arctic to the simple kind of security, hard security and defense uh, concept. Thank you very much. Um, I have now an, another question from uh, our audience and uh, you may raise the hand uh, because I, I'm not sure uh, it wasn't addressed to a certain uh, speaker. So I will give you the liberty to, to answer to it. Uh, given the current uh, tensions among the Ukrainian-Russian border and the Arctic states such as Canada, the US and Norway have taken a strong in condemning Russia's buildup of troops. How do you see this impacting the cooperation in forums such as the Arctic Council? This is one of the questions. Just, just a reflection. I'm not an expert on the Arctic Council, but um, of course, the Arctic Council, uh, like the whole uh, low tension regime in the north, rests on on a degree of predictability. You you trust the other guy that you know he means what he says. Um, the problem is that uh, this is so difficult to do now with Russia when it comes to Ukraine, for example, because Russia has this tendency and, and revealed this tendency to uh, to be less trustworthy than it used to be. That it it it, it guarantees the security of a country and then it it, it annexes part of it. Uh, and this, is, I think, is a, is a problem, and not necessarily undermining the, the cooperation uh, in the in the Arctic Council right away. But I think this this, at least for me, it would be a, a, a general sort of Damocles hanging over my head that I'm not sure anymore how much I can uh, rely on Russia as the guarantor uh, of a, of a regime, because Russia more and more says if the regime is not to my liking, I'll just overthrow it and 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 try another way. And and I think this is the tragedy of of Russia these days. That on the one hand it's rel it's reliant and it wants from us guarantees, security guarantees of sorts, but its 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 own behavior points uh, to a certain unreliability of, of of sticking to its own word. So uh, I think that's that's the, the tragedy. That also I think hopefully the the, the Gulf uh, sorry the Gulf cooperation the the uh, Arctic cooperation can be shielded against, but it it will not be possible to completely shield it against it. That's all. Elena, please. Sure, if I, I'll just jump in briefly and maybe also combine it with, I thought there were some interesting questions on Russia's approach to, to climate change, which actually I think brings something to the to the table here. I agree com uh, you know, completely that there, it's a matter of, of degrees. And I think it, there's within the Arctic Council, there's sort of these kind of longstanding kind of what we might call like low politics, like issues of mutual coordination when it comes to say kind of search and rescue activities, which I think are as close as you get maybe towards the security end of the spectrum, but also down to kind of working on contaminants or um, other issues, just as, for example, scientific cooperation relating to assessing forms of climate change. So I think the fact that the Arctic Council covers such a, such a range of issues also makes it a bit more, make it makes it robust that they're so longstanding and that they are in some ways in areas that you can remove from security and that you can point to all of the Arctic states having quite own interest, pragmatic interest in making these areas continue to work well. But I think, and I guess this can also be my one of my last contributions to the conversation is also, it does concern me that, you know, in, in the situation we are in today, there is not, or probably it's in today's situation, we can't anticipate the level of political goodwill or mutual trust, as, as Mikhail was saying, that would lead to kind of some of these higher level political agreements in the Arctic that I think have really historically in the past decade really brought a level of dynamism to Arctic decision making. And there, there are new other issues that would merit from that kind of level of um, high political agreement or binding agreement, maybe relating to radiation, or there's some talk of co mutual cooperation around forest fires. But I also think given the two, we had two other questions in the chat that I thought were really good about Russia and climate politics. And I think it's also, important to realize that occasionally, although Russia can play both kind of the, the knight in shining armor or the kind of the spoiler in international climate negotiations, that there has been a huge increase in terms of concern for how climate change is going to impact Russia's domestic Arctic, the, the infrastructure, the people, and even within Russia, even though there are major issues with safety culture and so on, there is a, 
certainly a, a sincere in many sectors concern for the environment. There was after this terrible um, pollution spill around nickel, they were slapped with a big fine. You know, it was there was an attempt to really make Russia's environmental legislation, which is quite good, but with lacks enforcement to really bring it to bear to some extent. So I think it's also possibly for me, given you know how I've looked at Russian Arctic policy over time for so long, it's it's a good reminder of how, of course, in the end, a lot of the political space is going to be shaped by how things go at the security level. But when it comes to Russia and their Arctic interests, there's a large range of actors. There are some very committed teams and individuals from Russia who are committed to making Arctic, these lower level Arctic networks work well. So I think that also particularly in these more difficult times, this kind of interconnection that has built up over the past few decades may serve to provide some avenues of, of communication and work. But again, my concern is about, you know, is it fit, fit to scale? Is it moving quickly enough? Is it dynamic enough? But that may indeed just have to be, we may have to hope that maintenance of the status quo is enough for the time being. Thank you very much. Marisol, would you like to bring your idea? Sure, yeah. So just responding to what um, Alana was just saying, um, you know, I think the thing is with, with Russia is that they've really taken an approach towards climate change that's focused on adaptation because they are so um, committed to being able to fully realize the commercial potential of their fossil fuel resources in, in the Russian Arctic because they want those short-term economic gains. Um, so, you know, oil, new coal that's coming online from the Tymere Peninsula, um, you know, yeah, new oil exploration that they're doing, obviously the gas. Um, and so what they're really focused on is limiting their stranded assets when it comes to, you know, to, yeah, to, to stranded assets that could be left behind in, in the green energy transition. And that focus on short-term gains plus uh, endemic corruption, plus just the, the vertical power structure and you know, really that, that lack of structure that allows them to think in terms of Russia's long-term interests is really keeping them from having a more rational and comprehensive approach towards climate change. And even with that, that nor nickel um, awful diesel spill, which was the biggest spill in Arctic history, you know, that was a combination of permafrost thaw, but also egregious violations of the facilities, you know, and this is a, a company, Nornickel is owned by Russia's wealthiest man, Vladimir Potanin. Uh, this is the company, they were publicly slapped on the wrist. Yes, they, you know, got a, a fine, but then they were awarded all these new contracts. They're expanding their operations into new areas. So it really shows the way that, you know, that decision-making is made, the way that contracts are distributed is it's really just so, you know, just it, it, it's highly problematic <laughs> just to, to put it lightly. Um, so I just kind of, and then especially like if Russia is really interested in the new, you know, market for, for carbon credits and their forests, but uh, you know, just the ability, the opportunities for fraud that are there, um, the ability to protect against wildfires that are, you know, degrading places that we're, we're counting upon for carbon sequestration. All of these are like part of the challenges with that. And so it is a place we need to be cooperating, but that takes me to the challenges that we're seeing with Ukraine right now and not you know, knowing how that's gonna play out. But if they do further invade, there will be economic, diplomatic and military consequences for the Arctic. And immediately, uh, you know, the sanctions package would start to be unrolled. And we've seen unprecedented cooperation between the US and the European Union um, and, uh, and Canada and the UK on on developing and coordinating these sanctions packages, but those would impact our ability to be working constructively with Russia on climate change and on innovation. And, you know, just so, so it gets, it's really challenging because you want to be firm with Russia, but we also can't cripple our ability to look at our long-term interests and, and the threats that are coming down the, the pike. 
Um, so just on, on the diplomatic side, you know, I, I want to note that after 2014, you know, certain meetings were boycotted, um, even though largely it's viewed that the Arctic Council persevered because it did, the Arctic Secure, um, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum persevered because it did, but you know, US Russian bilateral bilateral cooperation in the Bering Strait region stopped from until 2017 because of, of Russian annexation of Crimea. And this is going to be much, it, it would be much more challenging if this happens now because we would take a much stronger approach. And so the ability for this kind of cooperation at a time when Russia's increasing the amount of cargo to go through the Northern Sea Route and through the Bering Strait region, we need to be cooperating. So the, the diplomatic side of this and, and that practical cooperation you know, it needs to just be very, very carefully managed in terms of, you know, we don't want to be hurting our, ourselves in our response, but we do need to be um, very strong. And, and I guess, you know, also in terms of sanctions, you know, that's going to push Russia closer to China. And we have to just be aware of the fact that Russia and China are not only deepening existing uh, types of cooperation, but they're expanding the areas in which they're cooperating. And, and I think that that is demonstrating moving from a transactional kind of approach and a relationship to something that's much more aligned and very concerning um, from a lot of different levels. So that's, uh, that's where I'll end it. And uh, this has been a really great conversation. Thank you very much, Marisol. And we'll be ending our, our um, uh, panel with uh, one last question, both to Michael and Mikael, uh, on the areas where the EU and NATO could collaborate or are already collaborating in addressing all range of challenges that are specific to Arctic region. Are there any specific joint project or activities underway between the two organizations? Briefly, two or three minutes for each well, other. Uh, we, we pointed out in our um, joint communication on New Arctic policy in October that we did hope that um, one, I mean, we have a very close cooperation with NATO uh, on a lot of issues, and we hope that um, we would be able to uh, work together on strategic foresight with NATO and also with other partners, specifically on the medium to long-term security implications of climate change and you know that whether that be sharing data sharing studies or, or whatever but that's certainly something that we're aiming to to work together with NATO on so I think it's going to be a, a key part of, of of sort of shaping the future of, of the Arctic because everything is being so changed by what's happening with climate change a brief response yeah, equally brief. Um, I think once the strategic compass is out and our strategic con concept is out, then we have uh, uh, basically an, uh, a fresh set of mandates. Uh, and and um, I think uh, environmental impact assessment foresight uh, is one thing. I think we can learn a lot from the EU. Uh, not, it's not so much Arctic related, but, but climate related more generally about the green transition in the military, because the European Defense Agency has done a lot of great work in this respect. And we are working right now, for example, on a best practices compendium to see how our nations are dealing with the green transition in the military, because we feel the military cannot be an innocent bystander to the climate debate. It has to make its own contributions. Um, and then maybe scientific cooperation. Um, we are looking, we're trying to re, refocus our science program to do more stuff on climate uh, security. And uh, we'll see where, where, where this will take us. So I think the stage is set for a very fruitful cooperation. Yeah. Wow, that was super insightful. Thank you again for uh, all your excellent uh, remarks and uh, uh, for all your valuable ideas that you brought us today. And also I would like to thank our uh, participants for uh, bringing up so interesting questions and for following uh, our online policy. We at EPC uh, have many more great events in the pipeline, so please follow us online and see you at the next event. Have an enjoyable afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much. That was great. Goodbye.